It's that time of the year again for that annual flu of terror and despair. The dead are rising from the soil. Alcohol-infused socialites are wrecking the streets under the influence of a full moon. Uh, black fabric production's at an all-time high, and everyone's seeing spikes with razor blades. And I'd rather just sit here playing Nintendo games. Hey, oh, boom, watch this. You take horror, you take video games, smoosh them together, and congratulations. You've just upped the price on dry cleaning for as long as one of these stay on the top of the charts. You know I'm an adult, right? I don't need my mommy's permission to piss myself. Ooh, there's nothing like a bit of tension in a scripted sequence I'm probably not even paying attention to while the cutscene is playing. Horror games are just not for me. I love the eeriness of a well-crafted atmosphere when it enhances gameplay, but I think the adrenaline is sucked away from me when the actual impact of the moment happens. Was that it? No, what gets me is a good story based in reality. One of disbandonment with directionless idealism ultimately acting as a self-made catalyst towards the downfall from the greatest in the world. I mean, I was imagining a roach, but Atari works just as well, I guess. The Atari 2600, the dodo of the modern age. What a bittersweet tale of torment. Hey, they were the biggest. The Atari 2600 was synonymous and integral to the very definition of video games, way before the Master Systems debut or the NES, which revived the industry Atari helped burn down. The games might look more primitive than the controller you play them on. Well, this is really just a stick and stone with black spray paint over it. But there were still tens of quality titles for it. Tens! It just so happens, like every system from every generation, there was so much shoddy shovelware released on Atari system. Only then there was absolutely no quality control and minimal media coverage to help differentiate the good from the bad. Leading up to 1982, consumers were getting bored and felt ripped off with the quality of these games, so prices plummeted, development stopped being profitable, and it seemed as if having a console in your home was about to become a dying fad. My landlord said the same thing about sewage plumbing. While a lot of this was the fault of the industry as a whole rather than Atari as the platform creator, they undoubtedly had one of the most considerable lasting impacts in the eyes of many as to what inevitably resulted in the video game crash of 82, thanks to the release of one infamous title published by Atari themselves, the mantelpiece of the car that crashed and rot, Math Grand Prix. Alright everybody, welcome to the Math Grand Prix, alright, what's right, minus five, he's got nine, no, no, he's not got nine, he's always got a zero, he's got a zero, here he's got, he's right, he's right, he's coming in. And people pay to go to private school. Hello, operator. The dead are rising from the soil. Thanks to the video game crash, Atari felt a need to dump their excess unsold copies of their games, complete with cartridge box and manual, into a landfill. Yeah, we've gone bust. Rather than liquidate our assets and recoup what we can, let's just put more expenses into a Gucci gravestone. The main victim of media coverage surrounding the landfill was that of E.T., often considered the worst game ever created by people who've never played it, but to be fair, I can see why. Atari-handed programmer Howard Scott Warshaw the task of developing the entire game, independently, within the lifespan of a house flyer, measly five weeks, in time for a Christmas release. And it wasn't good! Gee, I wonder why. So, initial impressions? It's E.T. Hey, this looks pretty good, all things considered. When the vast majority of Atari games didn't even have a title screen, let alone music, I gotta commend the effort, if nothing else. When the game actually starts, though, I'd best describe its art style as animated cinder blocks. It's not really fair to rag on E.T.'s graphics behind its back considering circles didn't exist at the time of its release, but E.T.'s sprite has a serious case of lockjaw in this game. You would not recognise this man in a police lineup. 
everything else though looks pretty good. Doesn't mean I understand it though. As you move around the map, these ancient hieroglyphics appear at the top of the screen that historians are still trying to figure out to this day. No idea what they mean unfortunately, you don't get a manual with cartridges that break out of a desk. Speaking of movement, you seem to have an energy meter which diminishes as you walk around, but honestly if it gets to the point where you actually lose all your health, you need a new hobby like honestly mate. It genuinely takes forever, I spent most of the production time on this video just trying to find out what actually happens when you die. Wasn't worth it. Also contributing to the demise of E.T. are scientists and FBI agents, and you know, it was nice of Deke Entertainment to loan the rights of Inspector Gadget to Atari to use for this game. The scientists roam around the map in constant pursuit of E.T., plucking him out like a turnip and retrieving him to a jail cell if caught. That strategy rots as fast as a turnip too. That in itself ain't too bad, but half the time they get stuck up the corner caressing E.T. with a rigid grasp. But on the flip side, the FBI just rob E.T. of his telephone pieces and scurry off immediately. Great. Long term, all they do is waste a bit of your time. You've just got to avoid them like the various pits around the map. Likewise, time waster, but thankfully E.T.'s chiseled jaw can just lift him up. Okay. Okay, so just avoid pits, they're essentially a soft lock. Okay. I genuinely can't overstate how annoying these pits are. Sometimes it can take more than five monumentous attempts to escape one, only to immediately teleport to the next screen over and start the whole process again. It makes you cope and seethe at the mouth. Sometimes you don't even teleport. You move to the next screen over and plummet. So that's everything you need to look out for disruption wise. Now give me an objective. I don't know. Win? Thanks! But this is where things do get interesting. If you refer to the game's manual, there's actually an explanation as to what all these wingdings do on the top of the screen. Basically, I'm still lost, functionally. You need to find three pieces of a phone so E.T. can call home. The slimly blimlies at the top of the screen indicate actions E.T. can perform by overcoming tetanus. If there's a question mark overhead, that means there's a telephone piece in the area which will blink in a pit if you lift your neck to peep over. Fall down, pick it up, and you're a third of the way to completing a level. You'll lose a piece if you get caught by the noncy looking blokes, but otherwise bringing all three to an arbitrary call zone will start a countdown. Waiting at the initial landing site when the countdown ends will cause the spaceship to land, pick up E.T., and return him to Elliot's house, uh, essentially completing a level. You could consider this the ending, or give the game another rodeo to keep playing and try building upon your high score, but that's it. You run around, find clues, build a ship phone, and the game keeps looping and looping and looping forever. Perfectly in line with the arcade structure every game had back then. So why did it review so poorly? Because you need the damn Rosetta Stone to play it! Look, on one hand you've got one of the earliest elaborate adventure games ever created with an intricate system in place to handle how the player interacts with completion and opposition. On the other hand, you've got all of this in a world that makes absolutely no sense in a time where no one would bother to read an instruction manual because it was released during an era where games had less depth to them than conkers knocking into each other. Of course nobody understood it. Is it really the worst game of all time? No, it's cryptic and I blame a lot of its issues on oversight rather than being flawed at a technical level. But at the end of the day, there's a full playable game to be had here. And it's on Atari. It does a lot within those limitations. I commend that the game even has an ending at all, which says a lot about the error in itself. But it is a bit of a weird ending, considering you're spending the whole game trying to rebuild E.T.'s ship just so he can go home, only to end up back at the kid's house. I wonder if E.T. ever did actually make it home. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs>